The Time Machine, H.G. Wells. Uh, we're on page 38 of this particular edition. Seeing the ease and security in which these people were living, I felt that this close resemblance of the sexes was, after all, what one would expect. For the strength of a man and the softness of a woman, the institution of the family and the differentiation of occupations are mere militant necess necessities of an age of physical force. Where population is balanced and abundant, much childbearing becomes an evil rather than a blessing to the state. Where violence comes but rarely and offspring are secure, there is less necessity. Indeed, there is no necessity for an efficient family, and the specialization of the sexes with reference to their children's needs disappears. We see some beginnings of this even in our own time, and in this future age it was complete. This, I must remind you, was my speculation at the time. Later I was to appreciate how far it fell short of the reality. While I was musing upon these things, my attention was attracted by a pretty little structure, like a well under a cupola. I thought in a transitory way of the oddness of wells still existing, and then resumed the thread of my speculations. There were no large buildings towards the top of the hill, and as my walking powers were evidently miraculous, I was presently left alone for the first time. With a strange sense of freedom and adventure, I pushed on up to the crest. There I found a seed of some yellow metal that I did not recognize, corroded in places with a kind of pinkish rust and half smothered in soft moss, the armrests cast and, fled, uh, and filed into the resemblance of griffins' heads. I sat down on it, and I surveyed the broad view of our old world under the sunset of that long day. It was as sweet and fair a view as I have ever seen. The sun had already gone below the horizon, and the west was flaming gold touched with some horizontal bars of purple and crimson. Below was the valley of the Thames, in which the river lay like a band of burnished steel. I have already spoken of the great palaces dotted about amongst the, among the variegated greenery, some in ruins and some still occupied. Here and there rose a white or silvery figure in the waste garden of earth. Here and there came the sharp vertical line of some cupola or obelisk. There were no hedges, no signs of proprietary rights, no evidences of agriculture. The whole earth had become a garden. So watching, I began to put my interpretation upon the things I had seen, and as it shaped itself to be this evening, or that evening, my interpretation was something in this way. Afterwards, I found I had got only a half truth, or even a, or only a glimpse, a glimpse of one facet of the truth. It seemed to me that I had happened upon humanity upon the wane. The ruddy sunset set me thinking of the sunset of mankind. For the first time I began to realize an odd consequence of the social effort in which we are at present engaged. And yet come to think, it is a logical consequence enough. Strength is the outcome of need. Security sets a premium on feebleness. The work of ameliorating the conditions of life, the true civili civilizing process that makes life more and more secure, had gone steadily on to a climax. One triumph of a, a united humanity over nature had followed another. Things that are now mere dreams had become projects deliberately put in hand and carried forward, and the harvest was what I saw. After all, the sanitation and the agriculture of today are still in the rudimentary stage. The science of our time has attacked but a little department of the field of human disease, but even so it spreads its operations more steadily and persistently. Our agriculture and horticulture destroy a weed just here and there, and cultivate perhaps a score or so of wholesome plants, leaving the greater number to fight out a balance as they can. We improve our favorite plants and animals, and how few they are, gradually by selective breeding. Now a new and better peach, now a seedless grape, now a sweeter and larger flower, now a more convenient breed of cattle. We improve them gradually, because our ideals are vague and tentative, and our knowledge is very limited, because nature too is shy and slow in our clumsy hands. Some day all this will be better organized and still better, 
That is the drift of the current in spite of the eddies. The whole world will be intelligent, educated, and cooperating. Things will move faster and faster towards the subjugation of nature. In the end, wisely and carefully, we shall readjust the balance of animal and vegetable life to suit our human needs. This adjustment, I say, must have been done, and done well, done indeed for all time in the space of time across which my machine had leapt. The air was free from gnats, the earth free from weeds or fungi, everywhere were fruits and sweet and delightful flowers, brilliant butterflies flew hither and thither. The ideal of preventive medicine was attained, disease had been stamped out. I saw no evidence of any contagious diseases during all my stay, and I shall have to tell you later that even the process of putrefaction and decay had been profoundly affected by these changes. Social triumphs too had been affected. I see mankind housed in splendid shelters, gloriously clothed, and as yet I had found them engaged in no toil. There were no signs of struggle, neither social nor economical struggle. The shop, the advertisement, traffic, all that commerce which constitutes the body of our world was gone. It was natural on that golden evening that I should jump to the idea of a social paradise. The difficulty of increasing population had been met, I guess, and population had ceased to increase. But with this change in condition comes inevitably adaptations to the change. What, unless biological science is a mass of errors, is the cause of human intelligence and vigor? Hardship and freedom, conditions under which the active, strong, and subtle survive, and the weaker go to the wall, conditions that put a premium upon the loyal alliance of capable men, upon self-restraint, patience, and decision, and the institution of the family and the emotions that, ar that arise therein, the fierce jealousy, the tenderness for offspring, parental self-devotion, all found their justification and support in the Im imminent dangers of the young. Now where, are, now, where are these imminent dangers? There is a sentiment arising, and it will glow, grow against con connubial jealousy, against fierce maternity, against passion of all sorts. Nice job, Green Bean. Unnecessary things now, and things that make us uncomfortable, savage survivals, discords in a refined and pleasant life. I thought of the physical slightness of the people, their lack of intelligence, and those big, abundant ruins, and it strengthened my belief in a perfect conquest of nature. For after the battle comes quiet. Humanity had been strong, energetic, and intelligent, and had used all its abundant vitality to alter the conditions under which it lived and now came the reaction of the altered conditions. Under the new conditions of perfect comfort and security, that restless energy, that with us is strength, would become weakness. Even in our own time, certain tendencies and desires, once necessary to survival, are a constant source of failure. Physical courage and the la love of battle, for instance, are no great help, may even be hindrances to a civilized man, and in a state of physical balance and security, power, intellectual as well as physical, nice job, cucumber, would be out of place. For countless years, I judged there had been no danger of war or solitary violence, no danger from wild beasts, no wanting disease, wasting disease to require strength or constitution, strength of constitution, no need of toil. For such a life, what we should call the weak are as well equipped as the strong, are indeed no longer weak. Better equipped indeed they are, for the strong would be fretted by an energy for which there was no outlet. No doubt the exquisite beauty of the buildings I saw was the outcome of the last surgings of the now purposeless energy of mankind before it settled down into perfect harmony with the conditions under which it lived, the flourish of that triumph which began the last great peace. This has ever been the fate of energy and security. It takes to art and to ero eroticism, and then come, la come languor and decay. Even this ar artistic impetus would at, least, would at last die away, had almost died in the time I saw. 
to adorn themselves with flowers, to dance, to sing in the sunlight, so much was left of the artistic spirit, and no more. Even that would fade in the end into a contented inactivity. We are kept keen on the grindstone of pain and necessity, and it seemed to me that, there, that here was that hateful grindstone broken at last. As I stood there in the gathering dark, I thought that in this simple explanation I had mastered the problem of the world, mastered the whole secret of these delicious people. Possibly the checks the, they had devised for the increase of population had succeeded too well, and the numbers had rather diminished than kept stationary. That would, be, would account for the abandoned ruins. Very simple was my explanation, and plausible enough as most wrong theories are. Chapter 5 As I stood there musing over this too perfect triumph of man, the full moon, yellow and gibbous, came up out of an overflow of silver light in the northeast. The bright little figures ceased to move about below. A noiseless owl flitted by, and I shivered with the chill of the night. I determined to descend and find what I could sleep where where I could sleep. I looked for the building I knew, then my eye travelled along to the figure of the white sphinx upon the pedestal of bronze, growing distinct as the light of the rising moon grew brighter. I could see the silver birch against it. There was the tangle of rhododendron bushes, black in the pale light, and there was the little lawn. I looked at the lawn again. A queer doubt chilled my complacency. No, said I stoutly to myself, that was not the lawn. But it was the lawn, for the lep white leprous face of the sphinx was towards it. Can you imagine what I felt as this conviction came home to me? But you cannot. The time machine was gone. At once, like a lash across the face, came the possibility of losing my own age, of being left helpless in this strange new world. The bare thought of it was an actual physical sensation. I could barely, uh, I could feel it grip at me, grip me at the throat and stop my breathing. In another moment, I was in a passion of fear and running with great leaping strides down the slope. Once I fell headlong and cut my face. I lost no time in stanching the blood, but jumped up and ran on with a warm trickle down my cheek and chin. All the time I ran, I was saying to myself, they have moved it a little, pushed it under the bushes, out of the way. Nevertheless, I ran with all my might, all the time with the certainty that sometimes comes with excess of dread. <laughs> nice job, Cucumber. I knew that such assurance was po folly, knew instinctively that the machine was removed out of my reach. My breath came with pain, I suppose I covered the whole distance from the hill crest to the, little, to the little lawn, two miles perhaps, in ten minutes. And I am not a young man. I cursed aloud as I ran, at my confident folly in leaving the machine, wasting good breath thereby. I cried aloud and none answered. Not a creature seemed to be stirring in that moonlit world. When I reached the lawn, my worst fears were realized. Not a trace of the thing was to be seen. I felt faint and cold when I faced the empty space, among the black tangle of bushes. I ran round it furiously, as if the thing might be hidden in a corner, and then stopped abruptly when, with my hands clutching my hair. Above me towered the sphinx, upon the bronze pedestal, white, shining, leprous, in the light of the rising moon. It seemed to smile in mockery of my dismay. I might have consoled myself by imagining the little people had put the mechanism in some shelter for me, had I not felt assured of their physical and intellectual inadequacy. That is what dismayed me, the sense of some hitherto unsuspected power, the, through whose invention, intervention my invention had vanished. Yet of one thing I felt assured, unless some other age had produced its exact duplicate, the machine could not have moved in time. The attachment of the levers, I will show you the method later, prevented anyone from tampering with it the way that, in that way when they were removed. It had, it had moved and it was hid only in space. But then, where could it be? I think I must have been 
I must have had a kind of frenzy. I remember running violently in and out among the moonlit bushes all around the Sphinx and startling some white animal that, in the dim light, I took for a small deer. I remember, too, late that night, beating the bushes with my clenched fists until my knuckles were gashed and bleeding from the broken twigs. Then, sobbing and raving in my anguish of mind, I went down to the great building of stone. The big hall was dark, silent, and deserted. I slipped on, a, on the uneven floor and fell over one of the malachite tables, almost breaking my shin. I lit a match and went on past the dusty curtains of which I have told you. There I found a second great hall covered with cushions, upon which perhaps a score or so of the little people were sleeping. I have no doubt they found my second appearance strange enough, coming suddenly out of the quiet darkness with inarticulate noises and the splutter and flare of a match, for they had forgotten about matches. Where is my time machine? I began, bawling like an angry child, laying hands upon them and shaking them up together. It must have been very queer to them. Some laughed. Most of them looked sorely frightened. When I saw them standing round me, it came into my head that I was doing as foolish a thing as it was possible for me to do under the circumstances. In trying to re revive the sensation of fear, for reasoning from their daylight behavior, I thought that fear must be forgotten. Abruptly, I dashed down the match, and knocking one of the people over in my course, went blundering across the din big dining hall again, out under the moonlight. I heard cries of terror and their little feet running and stumbling this way and that. I do not remember all I did as the moon crept up the sky. I suppose it was the unexpected nature of my loss that maddened me. I felt hopelessly cut off from my own kind, a strange animal in an unknown world. I must have raved to and fro, screaming and crying upon God and fate. I have a memory of horrible fatigue, as the long night despair wore away, of looking in this impossible place and that, of groping among moonlit ruins and touching strange creatures in the black shadows, at last of lying on the ground near the Sphinx and weeping with absolute wretchedness. I had nothing left but misery. Then I slept, and when I woke up, when I woke again, it was full day, and a couple of sparrows were hopping around me on the turf within reach of my arm. I sat up in the freshness of the morning, trying to remember how I had gotten there, and why I had such a profound sense of desertion and despair. Then things came clear in my mind. With, with the plain, reasonable daylight, I could look my circumstances fairly in the face. I saw the wild folly of my frenzy overnight, and I could reason with myself. Suppose the worst, I said. Suppose the machine altogether lost, perhaps destroyed. It behooves me to be calm and patient, to learn the way of the people, to get a clear idea of the method of my loss, and the means of getting materials and tools so that in the end, perhaps, I may make another. That would be my only hope, a poor hope, perhaps, but better than despair. And, after all, it was a beautiful and curious world. But probably the machine had only been taken away. Still, I must be calm and patient, find its hiding place, and recover it by force or cunning. And with that I scrambled to my feet and looked about me, wondering where I could bathe. I felt weary, stiff, and travel-soiled. The freshness of the One morning made me desire know. an equal freshness. <clears throat> I had exhausted my emotion. Indeed, as I went about my business, I found myself wondering at my intense excitement overnight. I made a careful examination of the ground about the little lawn. I wasted some time in futile questionings, conveyed as well as I was able to such of the little people as came by. They all failed to understand my gestures. Some were simply solid. Some thought it was a jest and laughed at me. I had the hardest task in the world to keep my hands off their pretty laughing faces. It was a foolish impulse, but the devil begotten of fear and blind anger was ill-curbed and still eager to take advantage of my perplexity. The turf gave better counsel. I found a groove ripped in it, about midway between the pedestal of the Sphinx and the marks of my feet where, on arrival, I had struggled with the overturned machine. There were signs of removal about. I'm going to count to none. None! 
with clear, narrow footprints, like those I could imagine made by a sloth. This directed my closer attention to the pedestal. It was, as I think I have said, a bronze. It was not a mere block, but highly decorated with deep framed panels on either side. I went and rapped at these. The pedestal was hollow. Examining the panels with care, I found them discontinuous with the frames. There were no handles or keyholes, but possibly the panels, if they were doors, as I supposed, opened from within. One thing was clear enough to my mind. It took no great mental effort to infer that my time machine was inside that pedestal, but how it got there was a different problem. I saw the heads of two orange-clad people coming through the bushes and under some blossom-covered apple trees toward me. I turned smiling to them and beckoned them to me. They came, and then pointing to the bronze pen pedestal, I tried to intimate my wish to open it. But at the first gesture towards this, they behaved very oddly. I don't suppose I don't know how to convey their expression to you. Suppose you were to use a grossly improper gesture to a delicate-minded woman. It is how she would look. They went off as if they had received the last possible insult. I tried a sweet-looking chap, a sweet-looking little chap in white next, with exactly the same result. Somehow his manner made me feel ashamed of myself, but as you know, I wanted the time machine, and I tried him once more. As he turned off, like the others, my temper got the better of me. In three strides, I was after him, had him by the loose part of his robe round the neck, and began dragging him towards the Sphinx. Then I saw the horror and repugnance of his face, and all of a sudden, I let him go. Alright, I read a little bit extra there.